Welcome. I'm Linda Casey, Editor-in-Chief of Brand Experience Packaging Magazine, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the first part of BXP's and BMSD's new two-part town hall series, Creating Junction, with and led by John Gleason, founder and president of a Better View Strategic Consulting. I do have to apologize. The storm that has sweeps all across the U.S. and um, through uh, many of the southern states has left uh, me in beautiful, sunny uh, South Carolina with plenty of sunshine and sweet water, but not much Internet. So I'm joining you today by phone. And it is my great pleasure to be introducing John, who and John today will be talking to us from an industry point of view on managing relationships. He also will be exploring how agencies can maintain their business and regain their momentum while navigating the implications of COVID-19. We would like to start this event by thanking our sponsor, COG, without whose support this wonderful webinar series would not be possible. For those who are not familiar with COG, here's a quick overview. COG is a brand packaging development and prototyping company headquartered in Cincinnati, specializing in creating superior consumer engagement with brands. They provide customized services and solutions during the critical brand packaging development phases to facilitate innovation, optimize design to print development, accelerate speed to market, and reduce and avoid cost. To learn more about COG, visit their website at cogdriven.com. Again, a big thank you to COG for enabling us to present this webinar for free to registered attendees. And welcome, John. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, and, and welcome, everybody, from, uh, from all over the world. Uh, one of the things that, as, as I was talking with Jerry Brownstein and Linda Casey, uh, I, I had started to collect some information based on my uh, wonderful network and uh, my the access that I have to a number of people who share a lot of candid information. And and one of the other insights that I've picked up over my my entire career is if if there is something on your mind, if there's a challenge that you're facing, there's a very high likelihood that you are not alone. And so I wanted to, to pull together some of this information that I had collected. Some of it you know because you're living it. Some of it you may not see because you're so inundated with other things, trying to manage your, your teams, your, your client relationships, um, or manage your own business. And so, uh, so wanted to, to share some of those things. As, as I think about, uh, as we prepare for today, uh, we'll, we'll do a very brief introduction. We'll set the stage and uh, provide some context. Again, a lot of the things that you're, you know already because you're living it. Implications on uh, the economy, on consumer behavior, ultimately on clients, which then have implications on you as agency leaders. And, and then I'll, I'll offer the, what I call the so what. So, you know, I, I shared a whole bunch of information then to share some additional information as in the form of suggestions for things that agencies might consider as you continue to move your business forward. Uh, first, just very briefly, um, for those of you who don't know me, I spent 20 years at Procter & Gamble and was a part of their very early journey to elevate design more strategically in the DNA of their organizations. Uh, based on a lot of the things and my experiences in those roles at Procter and, and in particular in that design role, I launched my consulting business, which sets out to work on the client side of the industry, helping brands and corporations elevate design as a strategic business confidence on the agency side of the industry to try to help agencies become more relevant for the markets and the clients they hope to as they aspire to serve. And then the intersection of that those two worlds to to help enhance uh, client agency relationships. Some days I'm a marriage counselor, some days I'm a therapist, uh, some days I'm a negotiator helping one side or the other to, to find inspiring ways to move forward with each other. First, a, a big shout out, uh, thanks to Jerry Brownstein, Linda Casey, 
uh, Christine Yancey and the BXP team for, for collaborating with me on this. Uh, equally big thanks to uh, David Luxius and his COG team to, uh, to sponsor this town hall series for which we otherwise may not uh, be able to, to host it. And then to all of you who are investing your time, interest, and your curiosity today. Uh, and I'm, as Linda mentioned, I'm honored to be able to do this again, focused on client perspective next Tuesday. Um, just in terms of setup, um, given that my clients are both sides of the industry, corporate organizations and people, as well as agencies, I, uh, I, I have the ability to learn a lot of things about the industry from both vantage points. And I, I fairly consistently and constantly am surveying the industry formally and informally. Uh, around March 9th, when I started to see the, the increasing and escalating uh, safety measures, health measures, and economic measures that were resulting from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I started to, to more formally survey a, a number of people. I've talked to almost 100 client-side people, as well as more than 100 agency-side leaders and coached a number of corporate and agency organizations. Some of it just simply very quick sounding board kinds of things that don't cost anybody anything but a few minutes. Um, and then also have access some, some economic leadership and research to, to help with this. Um, so where are we? You're all living it, we, we all are living it. Um, there are a number of safety measures that were put in place in part to, to help, help prevent the spread of, of uh, the coronavirus, um, also to protect the capacity of our healthcare system. And as a result of those things, there have been economic implications, which then created uh, implications on humans, on the rest of us. Um, one of the common things that I've, I've seen that, that is, is a bit paralyzing for a lot of people is the notion of uncertainty. There's the health uncertainty, there's the, the, the family uncertainty with respect to kids at, uh, home from school, health. Um, and then, there, of course, there's the economic and business uncertainty. And, and where there is uncertainty, it's human nature to fill that void with our own story. And often cases, that's a, a worst case version. Um, a, as we think about the impact on humans, uh, there are a number of organizations that are sharing accelerated consumer confidence information. This particular one from GFK, a large research company, uh, if you focus on the orange numbers in the middle of the slide, you see a lot of downward arrows and numbers. Basically, those numbers indicate, typically this measure is done on a quarterly basis, but as GFK started to see uh, escalating or, or maybe in some cases declining um, consumer confidence, they, they accelerated their pace to, to measure not only monthly, but every, every other week. And the numbers that you see in orange represent the largest declines that they have seen in a single month since they've been conducting this their version of their consumer confidence barometer. Um, I won't get into the specifics, but, but you'll see that there are two sections on personal financial situation, one looking over the last 12 months and one uh, uh, an outlook for the, the, the coming 12 months. And then a general economic, two general economic situation metrics, which look over, again, previous 12 months and looking forward 12 months. Um, and, a, and a big drop you'll see in major purchase index. Consumers are not at this time planning to make any major, major purchases, homes, cars, uh, in the case of businesses, acquisitions, uh, large campaigns, large investments. Um, there, there's another view of consumer confidence, this coming from the conference board. I run a peer-to-peer -peer council of people who are heads of design from about uh, 25 or 30 different large corporations. And as a result, I have access to a lot of their economic research. And I found this to be a fascinating chart because it tracked consumer confidence related directly to a, a variety of crises um, that have happened in the U.S., um, on the far left, starting with the 9-11 terror attacks, 
through the Lehman Brothers financial crisis, which which kind of extended a recession between 2007 to 2012, and then a series of other um, uh, downward ticks in consumer confidence. And you can see on the far right, COVID-19 started at a generally positive consumer confidence point of view above 100, and it, it dropped dramatically and, and note that that metric was taken in the beginning of March. So fast forward another couple of, uh, another several weeks, and there that, that probably has a, an additional downward spike since, since uh, stay-at-home orders were extended for most of the U.S. The, the other thing that, I, I, again, you, you all know this already, um, the impact on both consumer confidence and actual economic performance uh, varies by part of the country by industry and sector. Um, and in this case, I, I just wanted to provide a, a very quick view. And, and by the way, this deck will be available for, for everybody um, after the presentation. Um, but you'll see different regions have different levels of pessimism, if you will. Um, the, the very top of the list, the East South Central, which is Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky, um, demonstrated the, the large drop, 31 uh, percentage points uh, downward from March to April. And, and you'll note that this is the, the largest single, one of the largest single month drops in the last 50 years since the conference board has been tracking consumer confidence. And the other numbers, the, the grade numbers, are a measure of uh, expectation index, which is looking forward into the next six months and what kind of optimism or pessimism do people have for the coming six months? And again, some regions like the Pacific region, not surprisingly, they, they had a huge pandemics in Washington, as well as the uh, Middle Atlantic, which is Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey. Um, also not surprising because New York leads the country in uh, outbreak and deaths. And so the, the, the resulting consumer confidence comes from that. And, and you can look at these more deeply. Uh, a, a different view of confidence is that of CEOs. Again, the conference board um, offers, oh, by the way, the, the URL that's on each of these slides, uh, the conference board typically is a membership program, but for COVID economic related um, and COVID pandemic related things, these are free and available to anybody that wants to access them. Um, again, this measure is typically quarterly and they took the quarterly measure in November, December, and, and numbers that are below 50 indicate more negative than positive responses. And, and I think the thing that, that is notable here is the trend. They, they, as, as the pandemic uh, measures e escalated, the conference board decided to, to uh, create more frequent metrics. And in uh, uh, between February and March, they took another slice that, that downgraded CEO confidence further. And again, just two weeks ago, they took another slice that continued to downgrade CEO confidence. Um, and, and, and one of the things that, that probably should be noted is the, uh, is how this, this translates from CEO confidence and, and, and into different industries. The, the, and, and again, most of you are either working with clients in many of these industries that are that are most uh, uh, broadly impacted and most deeply impacted, or they impact your personal life, your ability to, to, to go out to, to lunch or dinner, find childcare services, um, dentists, non-essential healthcare has been asked to shut down and not perform services, um, accommodations, travel, museums. Uh, again, you can look at uh, this this more more deeply. Um, when you look at the, the next round. Re regarding, uh, going back to the CEO implications, you, you'll see the kind of the, the, the de-escalating amount of, of emphasis on actions that CEOs and their organizations have taken. 100% of CEOs surveyed uh, were focused on trying to get employees up and running for virtual and remote working relationships, uh, travel bans and cuts. Uh, almost 90% see uh, impact a negative impact on profit and sales. 
Um, and, and again, we'll, you, you can look more deeply at a number of these metrics, but, but you're all living many of these things. One of the intriguing things, and, and this, this relates to agencies um, with respect, is the, the last one. Only 11% of CEOs surveyed said that they planned to switch suppliers at this time, which, which to me provides an element of confidence in their existing relationships, uh, sticking with the known and the proven, as opposed to the unknown and unproven in uncertain times and, and uh, rough seas, so to speak. Uh, another intriguing look at, at uh, the, the uh, implications of COVID-19 is, is comparing it to other crises and, and other challenges. What happened to the investment markets? Uh, during MERS and SARS, two other healthcare, health-related outbreaks, there was virtually no negative impact. And in fact, under the SARS outbreak, the, the market continued to respond po positively, almost um, immune to, uh, pun intended, immune to the, the, the healthcare risks that were rising out of that. Um, counter that to, not surprisingly, the financial crisis in 2008 uh, related to the, the Lehman collapse. Um, that was financial related, so not surprising that that had a, a massive impact on the financial markets. The intriguing thing is that the COVID-19 is, is with respect to its impact on markets, it has far less to do with the health implications and far more to do with the economic implications of shutting down industries, sh um, shutting down a lot of commerce. Um, and and, and again, this, this metric was taken in the middle of February, so expect a, a further decline and, and maybe some upward spikes with respect to the market in March and in April. And then the last thing from the conference board is uh, being surrounded with a, a number of brilliant economists. They have created their version of what they see as three, three potential recovery scenarios, what they call a May reboot, which is the blue line, um, and it's the, the, the most positive and quickest rebound to get us close to where we were economically as measured by GDP uh, before the, the pandemic uh, measures were put in place, a summer V-shape, which has a much deeper negative implication and then turns around, uh, as, as the, the name indicates, in the summertime. And then the fall recovery, which if you're hearing a lot of the things coming from the U.S. Uh, government and, and state leaders, that a, a slow emergence back into a recovery is a smart way to, to balance the health implications and the economic implications. And it's looking like that one might be a more realistic point of view. And then the, the graphs on the right are more a quarterly view of GDP in, that, in each given quarter under each of those scenarios. And so uh, a, a big dip in Q2, um, April, May, June, and some some rebounding and positive results in uh, in Q3 and Q4, and then of course into next year. Um, so, what does all this mean? One of the things that I have seen through my 200 conversations um, and other informal conversations is this notion of the pause button. I think most businesses and business leaders have chosen to at least take a, a temporary timeout to to assess. Budgets, economic situation, employment, the, the productivity of their organizations to be able to continue to collaborate and, and keep their operations running, um, and, and to some degree pivot their marketing stories or their brand stories from those of, of brands and, and traditional advertising to those that are, are more akin to we're with you, we're here to help you, we're in it together, uh, thanking healthcare workers and, and the like. So, so some of the other things that I've seen, I, I talked about brands pausing um, the, uh, the, their communications and their efforts. Um, the, the other thing that I've seen is, is a, by and large, an elevated level of empathy and understanding for each other. This is one of those circumstances where we, we all are going through very common experiences, working remotely. Many, many of us have kids at home. 
Uh, we are our partners, significant others, other members of our family are at home also working. Common fears, common challenges, and 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 the notion of of kind of understanding the glitches that come along with trying to learn how to work remotely and to collaborate remotely. Um, I am hearing some some interesting uh, reports of um, some clients that seem to be additionally stressed as a result of these. And 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 I, I'm, I'm smirking a little bit because a number of agencies have reported that there ain't no empathy with some of these clients because they're they're even more demanding than they might have been without the the COVID measures laying on top of it. And, uh, and, and there's clearly some pressure or some stress that are, that are sitting behind them on that. And, and one of the things related to glitches, um, I, I'm sure most of you remember this guy. In 2017, he was providing a live report on the BBC when his kids charged in, and then his wife or, or caretaker for the kids charged in to try to grab the kids, and we all laughed hysterically, uh, in part at his expense, um, and the other part was, thank goodness it wasn't me. But the, 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 the intriguing thing is under the, the current circumstances, we all have versions of this. Dogs barking in the background, kids coming up and wanting to be fed or want to play while you're on a conference call. And, and, and there's a, a much greater understanding. And now all of a sudden, that what, what, was, what was such a seminal moment for this guy and all of us in a remote world, now is everyday occurrences. Um, the, the other thing I want to jump into is, is what can we learn from previous crises and recessions? And one of the things that, that, that manifested itself only after the fact did we have a chance to really see it and, and learn from it is uh, design and marketing lagged the economic decline. In 2007, 2008, there continued to be a great deal of strong activity of, of marketing and branding activity of, of product and new product activity um, for, for three to four months. And, and then there was the dramatic drop off when, when uh, consumers were not going out to buy products in stores related to the financial crisis. And the other thing we only learned after the fact was recovery also lagged that the economic um, rebound started to occur and the, the investment back in brands and marketing lagged by three or four months. And the question is, uh, some industries are seeing booming business right now, and a lot of agencies are seeing no change to their, their uh, utilization and their revenues, and maybe even have seen increases. And is that a function of the lag, or is that a function of brands see this as a short-term opportunity? or a short-term crisis, and, it, and it's likely not to last four, five, six years. The other thing that we saw in the, the financial crisis was innovation virtually stopped. This was easy ways for companies to, to stop uh, budget hemorrhaging when their revenues and profitability was declining. And, and I think we're seeing a lot of brands and businesses continue to keep uh, a, a little bit of gas on the on the gas pedal, if you will, on their innovation efforts so that they don't get caught behind. And then the other big implication that I saw, and 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 it frankly it helped my business because I helped a number of agencies, is when brands asked for financial support and some and financial relief, budget relief from their agency partners, agencies ultimately relented and conceded in many cases in order to keep the business. But when the recovery occurred, they were unable to recapture that value because it had become embedded and it had become the new rate. And, uh, and, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. Um, so, so here we are in uh, COVID-19 world. Um, it, it's different because we have this substantial stay at home order, this, this social distancing, don't go out in public, no gathering of large groups. And, and so by the very nature of people staying home has fairly massive economic implications on brands and businesses. The, the intriguing thing, very much like the slide I showed you where um, the implications varied by region, they also vary by industry, not surprisingly. Some industries are booming. 
some some categories certainly the the obvious ones cleaning products uh, paper products um, shelf stable food packaged food um, th those categories boomed as as consumers bought everything that stores could offer in those spaces and so those companies likely have a great deal of cash and had great months of march or great q1s others are shut down um, non-essential retail uh, macy's the limited the, those types of retailers mall operators have furloughed 70 to 90 percent of their workforce and and some are booming now and potentially could see a decline later if the economic implications for these these circumstances continue to decline um, one of the things that I think most brands recognize in my conversations with them is that they're already starting to think about not only the current situation, is my current marketing and messaging appropriate in these times, and how might I pivot that, but also what does my exit plan and my exit strategy look like? How am I going to be able to, to uh, rebound and, and be at, at full speed at best I can? when the economy turns. Um, and and as, as a result of that, I think a lot of people are seeing this and, and perceiving this to be a much shorter term challenge uh, than 2008. And as a result, they, they've probably not pared back uh, as much in their, their budget uh, plans and their, their initiative plans as they might otherwise have. And, and then the learning from 2008, Many companies have paused, but but not entirely stopped or canceled projects. Um, they're assessing budget plans, their appropriateness, um, and and many companies have not put a full stop on their innovation pipeline this time around, versus doing so in 2008. Uh, Marketing Week did a, a, a survey. Uh, I'll briefly go through some of these on the the changing. Uh, plans to marketing priorities between March 1 and April 1. And during their March 1 uh, survey, for example, the first one changed employee policies. Only 44% uh, had, had indicated that they had changed employee policies. By April 1, that was 86%. Updating customer policies, return policies, discount policies, pricing policies from 17 to 46 between March 1 and April 1. Um, changed marketing strategies from 18% to 62 And notably, as it relates to the agency community, the, the last two, delaying budget commitments or delaying or reviewing campaigns, going from 55 and 60% to 85 and 90%, respectively. So th this, the, the, the speed at which this, this has caused uh, marketers to change and then therefore implications on agencies has been fairly profound. Um, so, some of the other implications, you, you already know most of these things, but, but I, I think there will be some longer term implications on not only consumer confidence, but on where brands play. Um, for example, I think the fact that we're doing without an awful lot of those luxuries and those nice to haves right now is going to call into question either I'm going to it's pent up demand and I'm gonna go recapture all those wonderful things, those dinners out or, or luxury cars or, or uh, extra, the, the premium products, um, or I'm gonna evaluate that maybe I didn't need them or they don't need to be there. I think the other thing that's gonna come out of this that brands might think about leveraging is I think there's gonna be a greater appreciation for those people on the front line taking care of our communities, our children, and, uh, and our food supplies, for example, teachers, healthcare workers, our favorite restaurants. I think uh, a lot of big companies had put in a lot of video conference capability to try to stem some travel expense. I think this really is going to cause a lot of companies to, to, to think twice about all of the travel that they incur. That, that we we were able to survive it, perhaps under emergency circumstances, but I do think it will change the trajectory of some travel budgets. And I think it will call into question brand loyalty to a, a great degree. During the 2008-2009 financial crisis, when, when budgets were cut, sales were down, consumers considered and actually switched to private label brands, and many of them didn't switch back. 
Um, the fact that there are those high demand products, those, those cleaning products, wipes, sanitizers, paper products, food products that are all out in our grocery stores. And we're, we're being, quote, forced to buy whatever's available. I think that becomes a trial opportunity for brands. And then what retailers or what other companies stepped up in unique and delightful ways that are going to be remembered for this? There, there's a pizza place here in Cincinnati that more out of a joke, they offered a roll of toilet paper with every pizza that was ordered. And they said nothing about it, but their consumers and their customers shared it on Facebook and Twitter, and it drove their business up, uh, so much so that they had to stop taking orders for a period of time. Um, and, and then the other thing to, to think about, and, and this is where I think the agency community can really help clients, is potential pivots. Under emergency circumstances, you see a lot of companies suddenly making things that they've never made before, hand sanitizers, personal pr protection uh, equipment, ventilators, face shields. Um, will some of these companies continue to make these things when the pandemic circumstances are over, or will they disappear? Uh, you know, you, you think about Tesla and General Motors and Ford making ventilators. Um, they, they've got installed capital for that, that equipment now. Are they going to continue, or might they spin that business off to create new competition in the marketplace, uh, which could be interesting opportunities for, for brands and for agencies. Um, companies that are offering services that they hadn't offered before. There are a number of restaurants that are getting into the grocery business, that if you're placing a, a carryout order with them, you can also pick up a gallon of milk, some fresh vegetables, a loaf of bread, some basic grocery staples that will keep you from having to go into a grocery store and either fight the crowds or fight the risk of, of health challenges. And how many of those will continue? Most of them are probably for positive brand halos and PR, but some of those may continue or they may find interesting ways to, to extend that into other services. Uh, laws have changed. Um, for heaven's sakes, uh, in a lot of places, you can get margaritas by the gallon now because uh, carry out alcohol laws have changed in a number of states, in part to, to keep restaurants moving forward. And I guess the other part is to keep us fueled with our adult beverages. And it'll be interesting to watch the legal landscape to see where where some of those might be permanent changes and where they might where others may reverse when when the uh, the economic times change. And then the whole work from home, flexible work arrangements, I think, is going to be a profound opportunity. Um, and, and for those of you who have uh, the new normal on your conference call bingo card, you can play it now because I just said it. Um, but I do think that there is a num there, there will be a number of companies that review their practices and policies uh, companies, I think a lot of companies are going to realize that they don't need to have everybody show up in, in a common place all the time because they haven't been for a month and probably will be for another month. Uh, employees, I think even more profoundly, are going to find the benefits of these flexible arrangements, especially when their kids aren't being uh, homeschooled when the schools are closed. And they're going to see the benefit of, of no commute. They're going to see the productivity and convenience advantages. And they're going to demand a, a more flexible arrangement. And John Gleason's opinion, this is not an official economic factor, I believe there's a chance that there may be a real estate glut uh, in three to five to ten years, given all of the real estate that might be given up by these companies who realize I don't need such a large uh, uh, real estate footprint. Um, getting to the, 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 some of the study that I had conducted, um, just very quickly on the human side, 27% of the respondents were one degree away from a COVID patient, a family member, a friend who they knew personally. Um, uh, about half were two degrees away from a COVID patient. 96% um, uh, of the people uh, were impacted by COVID circumstances. Those are the, the full range, health, safety, convenience, family, economic. And, and it should be noted that most of the 4% delta that keeps that from 100% were taken in the first week of my survey before major stay at home, work from home kinds of uh, orders and mandates were put in place. 
Um, the, the greatest concerns, again, are human and emotional. So, so getting to the crux of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, safety, food, shelter, um, job loss, balancing work and family and food and, and housing, uh, collaborating with business colleagues was another challenge. And coaching, how do I coach and develop my teams if I'm not seeing them more frequently? And, and then the other opportunity, I think some of you on this hall play in, in some of these spaces and have tools and, and procedures and processes that, that you could offer clients. I think the, the work from home and, and remote working is, is also exposing a lot of unprepared or inefficient client processes. Notably, if they don't have a solid workflow or, or good, strong decision-making processes, they're probably feeling a lot of pain. If they don't have robust digital asset management systems, they're feeling a lot of pain. And if they don't have adequate libraries of digital assets that they can use to, to put new messaging into the marketplace or new products, um, I, I think because in, in most states, you can't go do a photo shoot. You can't shoot an ad. You can't, uh, you can't bring uh, large groups of people together. And so I think there are some opportunities for many of you out there that might be able to help your clients through some of these um, if, if you note that they have some of those challenges. Some, some other factors that, that are interesting, but, but again, most of you are, are know it because you're living it, um, 68 percent of clients say they now face increased challenges as a result of the COVID circumstances. That number is 89 percent for agencies. Um, uh, on the agency side, 62 percent said they have seen one or more clients freeze or pause work. And 78 percent believe that they're unable to carry on uh, proactive and productive new business development efforts. So the, the ability to grow your business in these times is being challenged in, in part because you believe it's not appropriate to be out selling. And the other is how, how do you go uh, potentially make those calls um, in a virtual world, in a world where, where clients, according to the CEO confidence, have said they're likely not to switch their, their suppliers. Um, but how do, you, how do you go reinforce that, that measurement and that opportunity? Um, the, the, another question was, how many of you have seen positive implications, uh, business implications as a result of the, the, the COVID circumstances? 41% uh, of the clients that I spoke to have experienced big gains in the months of March and April, and they anticipate May to, to be comparable. Um, they're a little bit less certain about June, July, and August. 50% of agencies have seen some gain in business since March 9th, and only 14% of ad agencies, media firms, shopper and digital agencies have, have experienced growth since uh, March 9th. Um, and, and then another interesting one back to changing agencies is uh, only about a quarter of the, the clients that I spoke to said that they, that they did plan to evaluate their roster and change agencies during this crisis period because they felt it was a good time to, to evaluate. More than half said, no, they weren't going to do that. Either they had higher priorities or they just thought it was bad form or bad taste to, to try to take advantage of the circumstance. And then 23% said maybe, and, and most of them kind of talked about the potential of one-off experiments with agencies that they might have been looking at. Um, and, and one of my favorite questions in this survey, and, and we won't go into a lot of this, is um, what would you most like to ask or say to your clients, but you're too proud, too afraid, or too embarrassed to ask? And by the way, this, these questions will prominently feature in my, my client um, webinar next week as a way of trying to get these questions in front of clients generically. Um, things like, why did you choose to change agencies and why now? And again, that applies to the COVID circumstance or any other circumstance. Um, uh, a couple agencies kind of indicated that clients had great months or great quarters, but are still asking for the agency to lean in with, with rate and budget cuts. Um, uh, some, some more altruistic 
uh, and I think this came mostly from agencies who were in better shape than than others. Seeking honest and vulnerable perspective. What are the what are your greatest ambitions and struggles? How might we be able to help? Um, a, a lot of questions that are on your minds. And and then there's a whole page and probably even more than a page devoted to your friend's procurement. Um, you know, what value do they offer? Have they considered that the actions that procurement drives might actually cost the client more over time? That they're training clients to behave or cl training agencies to behave in a transactional way, which also removes kind of the halo of, of strategic relationships. Um, and and you, can, you can look more deeply at, at this procurement page at, uh, some, at some other point. So I, I shared all of that to, to offer the so what's, those, those things that you might consider as agencies. The, the first one is, is develop a plan. You should be doing this as a, as a normal course of business. If certain things happen in your business, you will take certain actions when your heads are calm, when potentially when the, the business is stronger, um, and when there isn't emotion attached to it. And developing multiple scenarios. If this happens, then we'll do that. If if X happens, we'll do Y. Um, whether it's cutting time, cutting people, um, firing clients, whatever those things might look like. Um, be ready to take action when you need to, so you don't prolong a decision and and prolong the impact of a bad decision potentially. And where appropriate, communicates the, these plans with your team. If you've got a culture that embraces uh, visibility and transparency with your team, then tell them, hey, if our business drops below X, we're going we're gonna to furlough people. We're going to cut your, your time to four days a week instead of five or to 80%. And this is what's going to happen so that they're enrolled and enlisted. And other of you don't have cultures that that, that would create even more disruption. So, so don't go do that. The other thing to keep an eye on is, is in substantial financial times, particularly when they're broad economic, um, resist taking on expensive debt obligations because those often prolong your recovery when everybody else is recovering and profitable, you have additional cost to bear as, as you begin to come out of a recovery or it hides or exacerbates some other underlying issue. However, in the present circumstance in the U.S., there are a, 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 a several aid packages that are available, either low cost or forgivable loans that, that may actually be beneficial for you to look into if you haven't. Um, importantly, check on your customers, check on your clients. They're going through some of the same things you are. I, I mentioned the you are not alone, and it's not just the agency community on this call that might be alone. Your clients are going through the same challenges. How do I collaborate with my team? How do I to how do I motivate and inspire my agency? How do I go find the right insights that provide the fuel and inspiration for the the, the work that that I'd like to see? Um, offer to help, even if that means discounted rates or 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 unpaid, depending on the budgets and your staffing. But but show up as a as a good partner. And I'm not advocating giving away work. But there may be circumstances that this, this provides a, a wonderful halo for you. Um, give them your view of the market. Uh, I've got a client, uh, an agency who specializes in a particular industry and category. And three or four of the smaller clients, and those companies happen to be smaller businesses, said that they were freezing or stopping some of their initiative work. They went back and said, because we're an expert in this category, you should know that some of your competitors and our clients are continuing to invest so that they don't miss important launch windows or important season seasonal uh, launches. And, and uh, three of the four of those clients uh, restarted those projects. So that's something that you all may think about is you have a, a broad view across industries, across sectors, across stages of business that you might be able to offer some coaching to your agencies that, that encourage them to, to increase their investment or to restart their investment in their brands. And, and importantly, you see patterns that they may not be able to see. 
e either because you're you're outside of their political walls or you you're, you're you're taking that look across industry specters um from a financial perspective one of the easy things you can potentially do is ask your clients to accelerate invoice payments as payment terms get longer and longer they they may be able to to show a little empathy and accelerate payments that are owed to you as a way of trying to keep you cash um, uh, flush with cash and, and additionally, if you're close to a, a project milestone, is there a way that you might be able to finish that milestone so that you can invoice and then potentially get an accelerated payment? Um, where appropriate, I won't go into all of these. Remind them of some things. You know, you're a small business. You're trying to keep your team employed. You're trying to, to, to manage their brands and their priorities. Um, you have a view of the industry. That, In fact, the, that third bullet, is to me is a great argument for anybody that's facing clients who are taking work in house that they will never ever be able to replicate the view that you have across multiple industries categories and and uh, stages of business um, with their in-house team and in fact that will get more narrow and more narrow and more narrow over time that that remind them that you've got a view and you bring that to their work every day uh, you, just like them, you want to see growth, and and, uh, and and so part of this is is playing to that empathy and that emotional side of of clients. And and then the big one with respect to to there, there was a question that came in about is, is are there things that you might be able to do to 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 uh, allay potential budget request budget cut requests from clients? If they ask, first understand their situation. Is their business legitimately down, or did they, they just have a monster killer first quarter, and they're they're asking for cuts? And and understand how you might react in those circumstances. The other thing that I saw when I was at Procter and Gamble, and I've seen since, is is most agencies don't separate the client as a person from the client, the company, and and these circumstances really help help you potentially figure out how do you separate those have empathy and compassion for the person or the people but how do you be firm with the company because like you they're running a business and vice versa and if you do decide to lean in with some help with some financial concessions some things i i offer to to, to help um and and this is true of any negotiation if you're thinking you'll concede pricing whether it's COVID circumstance related or normal circumstance. Anytime you think you, you want to offer something, always ask for something in return. And, and many of those things don't cost the client anything more. Additional projects, new work, new capabilities, new brands or regions. Uh, perhaps you can say, I'll, I'll concede if I can get 15 or 30 day payments during this COVID crisis or testimonials for those those hard to pin down clients or co-present at a conference or run a workshop. Um, clearly specify what it is you're offering. Is it a discount off pricing? Is it specific pr new prices at, at different uh, uh, different billing rates for different levels or or competencies in your in your agency? Um, establish and clarify that this is short term help. You ask for it. We're we're being a good partner. We're leaning in, and that it has an expiration. And on that expiration, you'll review to see if it if it makes sense to extend. Get it in writing, and then a really tiny thing, but really critically important in my opinion, is explicitly show those discounts on all of your proposals, SOWs, invoices as a line item. Bill them at your normal agreed billing rate and show the discount because then when the when the economic circumstances change all you need to do is remove those discounts and you have a provable track record to to be able to to go through um and and then the last um slide that i have here for you is on the positive side you no doubt are seeing amazing ideas ahas inspirations coming up with with opportunities for yourself and for your clients. Lean into and leverage those things. Try to find ways to activate them and build them. 
follow your curiosity. I do think that there will be a number of, of uh, new business models that will come out of this, this crisis um, and, and new opportunities, whether it's a pivot, whether it's something for your clients. The next one is, is help your clients bring those wonderful ideas to life so that they might be able to activate new products. And, and the last thing is take this time as an agency and an agency leader and an agency team to focus on yourself. Build skills on your team, explore who you are, what you wanna be when you grow up. Uh, try to find a candid assessment of how you show up in the industry. That usually is, is through an, an independent third party, whether you have a, an advisory board, whether you have some trusted advisors or coaches, um, people that will, will tell you what they what you really need to hear, not what they think you want to hear. Um, finally, getting around to updating your website. My research has shown that, that most agencies' websites are at least three years and more likely five or six years out of date versus what they're saying in current capability presentations today. And is there a way to better align those messages? Because you may miss an awful lot of business opportunities for people who do uh, online shopping before they call you or before they invite you to the RFP or before they decide on an RFP. Um, proactively seek out how clients see you. I can't tell you how many times that, that when I ask an agency, oh, why did this client stop working with you? Oh, well, they, they decided to change directions. But then when I call that client, they say something far more uh, explicit and far more direct. And it might impact a, a person or a process or a perception that occurred. And then as you're, you're all likely doing, find, uh, find helpful resources, webinars, association groups, uh, peer groups that might be able to help you. And with that, uh, I want to thank you all for your time and your patience. Um, I do have in the deck a, a, a series of additional resources, the, the links to the conference board. Uh, the World Federation of Advertisers has a, a really interesting compendium, a COVID compendium on marketers that are doing inspiring things. Um, there's there's uh, an online collaboration tool that I find that I've used personally called Battery that, that could be uh, uh, intriguing and interesting for you to take a look at. But with that, uh, we've got about eight minutes left, and uh, I'd say let's let's turn to some questions. So, John, I know that you've got some questions that uh, were sent in with by our registered attendees. You were in such anticipation of hearing some answers from them. Could you, could you address some of those questions first? Absolutely, Linda. Thank you. Um, so, so one of the questions is in line with something that I shared. Um, what do you do when people are slashing ad and marketing budgets? Uh, and, and how do you make a convincing argument that now's not the time to cut budgets? Um, and, and so Gary, thank you for that question. And, and, I, and I'll go back to um, the, the fact that there are some clients that, that, that kind of in, inherently know that now's not the time to be cutting. Um, the, the messaging they have in the market may not be the right message, but I, I think you as an agency leader have access to what's happening with all of your other clients, especially if they're in the same categories or in general industries as, um, as the client that may be asking for relief and, and share, you don't, don't, don't give away who those clients are or, or anything that violates confidentiality. But you may talk about, hey, there are three other clients that, that I'm working with in, in adjacent industries that are actually increasing their, their spending right now. Are you sure you want to be cutting? And then the, the, the things that I've shared about uh, if you do decide you might consider it, what things might you get in return for that? So hopefully, Gary, that, that helps answer that question. Great, John. And, you know, we've been getting some questions during the event. So uh, attendees, if you haven't seen the question box, you should see a widget up on your screen. If you don't see it, just look for the tab at the bottom of the screen and submit your question there. And so we are going to go to uh, a um, question from Deborah. So Deborah from uh, the DBA is asking, do you think clients will skill up internally and take work in house, or might they actually cut headcount and the opposite happen? 
Uh, Deborah, hi, Deborah. How are you? Um, I think that's a fantastic question. Uh, my personal belief is that that if an organization truly believes this is a short term uh, economic dynamic, then they will likely continue to to grow their in house team. I, I think those that are doing exceptionally well right now probably have a greater incentive because they don't have to look at they don't have to scrutinize overheads, but I, I also believe that if this, if the economic indica indications extend into the end of the year and perhaps into next year, I do think that those efforts to bring talent and capability in-house, I, I think those will be some of the first people that get pushed back out because there's an active industry that can can serve those. So, I, I think it's going to be a company by company and industry by industry factor. Um, but I, I do think uh, for the, the headcount cuts to occur profoundly in client organizations, I, I, I do think that the, the economic uh, situation will have to continue, uh, go deeper and longer for, for those cuts to occur. But one person's opinions. Great question. Thanks. And John, we have about four minutes left, so we don't have a lot of time. We might have time for one more question. So my question to you is, do you want to take one of our our questions from our registration, attend registration attendees or one of the questions that we have live? Um, uh, let, me, let me take one of the, let me take maybe two of the ones that, that uh, people submitted with their registration. Um, That's a good the, idea. the first I've been one in a while. The, the, the first one is, how do you think COVID-19 will impact the momentum we had with sustainable business, uh, addressing issues as climate, water scarcity, um, plastic population, purpose-driven marketing? It, it, it's my personal belief um, that, that, uh, that, that that will have th – those efforts probably have been frozen. It's probably not a high priority for a lot of corporate organizations right now because they're more concerned about uh, maintaining the jobs for their, their teams, uh, building and, and making sure operations run forward. Um, I do think – I don't think it will slow it down with respect to if you think about this just hitting the pause button on sustainability efforts. I do think that uh, when we turn the corner and come out of this, I, I think that brands will re-engage in th those that are invested in it and see it as a as the right thing to do and the right thing for their business. They'll re-engage and, and pick that back up. And and then the other question that that I have here is, uh, with today's environment shaping new ways to work, how do you see the future of of client agency working relationships? Um, i.e. more virtual workshops, less real in-person interaction. Um, I, I do believe that we will see more virtual connections. Um, I, I think that there are clients that are, that are running RFPs and pitches that are, that are asking agencies to, to weigh in on new projects, and all of that is happening virtually. I don't think that that will become a predominant way of, of managing ongoing because my, it's my personal belief that during the current pandemic crisis, that with that heightened level of empathy, that we have a greater understanding and a, and a greater willingness, because we have to, to do those things. I do think uh, with respect to new agencies, one of the philosophies that I had always tried to operate by at Procter & Gamble and coaching my corporate clients since then is you shouldn't be selecting an agency if you've not visited their place to get a sense for their culture and, and their vibe and, and their team. And, and I do think that, that clients need to, to, to have more face-to-face. -face. And, and I think agencies need to be more proactive about having uh, out-of-sequence of connections, things that aren't directly related to a specific project so that they can manage and talk about their relationships. Hopefully that helps. Well, thank you so much, John. Unfortunately, we have less than a minute to wrap things up, so we're going to wrap it up really quickly. So a big thank you to John for your insights. Everyone on this call for the thoughtful questions. And on that topic, Jessica, this town hall broadcast will be available to you and your colleagues on demand. And um, another 
big thank you to our sponsor, COG, without whom this free event wouldn't be possible. Please return their support by visiting COG's website, COG'sDriven.com, C-O-G, Driven.com. On behalf of COG, John Gleason, me, and the rest of the DXP and VMSC magazine staff, I'm trying to get this in before the uh, finishing line. I would like to thank you for your time today and hope that hope the insights shared today will help your agency navigate through this difficult time. So thank you all. Thanks, everybody. And, and for those questions that we didn't get to, we'll try to answer them separately so that you get them and, uh, and, and you get that perspective. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, and hopefully see you next week.